Supreme Court decision known as Edwards versus Aguilard that identified creationism as a religious doctrine. Literally within a month of that decision, the drafts changed from creation and creationism to intelligent design and designer. Basically, there's no question that this was simply relabeling the old product with new pack packaging to make it palatable. And again, this is something else that came out remarkably so at the trial. And what the judge wrote is the plaintiffs meticulously presented, you had to be there to see this, several drafts, some of which were completed prior to and after the Comport decisions, and three astonishing points emerge. One, definition of creation science is identical to the definition of intelligent design. Cognates of the word creation appeared about 150 times, were deliberately and systematically replaced with ID, and the changes occurred right after the Supreme Court said that creation science is religious. So the history of this was very straightforward. Um, the members of the, the judge also wrote, um, and this was an extraordinary thing to hear. I'm gonna move my lapel pin down by my microphone so you can hear the audio clip in just a second. The judge says, you know, the citizens of the Dover board uh, of Dover were very poorly served by members of the board who voted for the ID policy. Here are two of them up here, former members of the board, now voted out of office. To me, it's remarkable to hear a federal judge talk this way. It is ironic that several of these individuals who so staunchly and proudly touted their religious convictions in public would time and time again lie to cover their tracks and disguise the real purpose behind the ID policy. I don't know about you, but I didn't know federal judges talked like that. <laughs> and I found that absolutely astonishing. Now there is at least one, sorry, there is at least one person who understood what the policy was all about. All of you know who that person is, and he called it exactly right. Here he is. Last month, the people of Dover, Pennsylvania voted to dismiss school board members who supported the theory of intelligent design. But according to some people, that's not all they voted out. I'd like to say to the good citizens of Dover, uh, if there is a disaster in your area, don't turn to God. You just voted God out of your city. <laughs> Pat got it right. Um, <laughs> this really is a religious idea. And what's astonishing is to see Robertson saying exactly what this is all about. And once again, I think uh, uh, regardless of what you think of the Reverend Robertson, um, I think he was exactly right from his point of view that this was a religious question. Now, um, the question I think that all of you in Ohio have to consider is, is this critical analysis lesson plan that you now have in Ohio, is this really different from the Dover approach? And I've read opinion columns saying immediately, oh no, it's got nothing to do with it, it's entirely different, the Dover decision is not precedent, that's true, it's just a district court decision. But all of the information that I have talked about tonight was unearthed at the Dover trial and it's all available. After all, the Discovery Institute came here and told you, didn't they? That they do not want to teach intelligent design in public schools, that's just not their policy. Yeah, that's Stephen Meyer, he's the guy who said that. Stephen Meyer is the author of a book called How to Get Intelligent Design into Public School Curriculum. So if you hear him saying momentarily, no, we don't want to teach intelligent design in Ohio schools, I think the proper way to understand that is we don't want to teach intelligent design in Ohio schools yet. We'll figure out a way to do that. Um, and the lesson plans, of course, don't have anything to do with creationism or intelligent design, do they? Well, guess what? If you look very closely at those lesson plans, what you will discover is the topics for the five lesson plans. Of those five lesson plans, four of them come directly out of the Pandas and People book, the creationist book that was relabeled as an intelligent design textbook, and the fifth one comes directly from Michael Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box. These are also found in a whole series of other uh, intelligent design textbooks, including Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells. And you might ask yourself, well, are any of these really intelligent design books? Go to the Discovery Institute website, and you will find that these are touted as the source books of intelligent design. And the judge realized that correctly, and he wrote something that I think applies directly to Ohio, and as, as I think worth thinking about. And that is, intelligent design's backers have sought to avoid the scientific scrutiny, which we have now determined that it cannot withstand by advocating that the controversy, but not ID itself, should be taught. And what Judge Jones wrote was this tactic is at best 
disingenuous, and at worst, a canard. The goal of the intelligent design movement isn't to encourage critical thought, but to foment a revolution which would supplant evolutionary theory with ID. And that is part and parcel of the lesson plans now adopted in the state of Ohio. Um, people might say, well, let's be fair. Um, isn't the scientific community biased against intelligent design? Isn't it prejudiced? Doesn't it suppress it? Um, I think that idea under overlooks how often science deals with novel scientific claims. But what we expect people to do is to do real research to back up those claims, to submit them to peer review, to engage in the give and take of scientific argument, to win a scientific consensus, and eventually, if the evidence is on the side of these ideas, no matter how goofy they sound at first, and no matter how much the scientific community opposes them, they will eventually find their way into classroom and textbook. Now, intelligent design advocates like to say they've got a new scientific idea, too. And you know what? If they wanted to do this, I'd be thrilled. I'd say, see at the cell biology meetings, see at biochemistry, see at the earth science meetings. We'll have fun. We'll argue about this. And I'll show you that you're full of it. But you know what? Maybe you'll do the same thing to me. Maybe you'll come up with the experiments, with the evidence, with the analysis that will show you're right. And if you are right, in 10, 15, 20 years, we won't have to go to the school board and argue. You'll automatically be in classroom and textbook. But their idea of how the scientific process should work is not exactly like this. It is rather like this. And that is they would like a direct injection into classroom and textbook. And they'd like that injection with the aid of the political process, which is exactly why they've concentrated not on research. They don't produce any. Not on peer-reviewed publications and not on winning scientific consensus. What they have concentrated on is public relations and political pressure. You might also ask yourself, how many scientific organizations around the country have criticized these Ohio lesson plans? And a few of them are shown up here, including my own scientific society, the American Society for Cell Biology, um, a society that is resident to many, many Nobel laureates and one of the largest experimental societies in the United States. The source for all of this information, by the way, is a great organization called Americans United for Separation of Church and State. If any of you are interested in their activities, they have a very simple web address, AU, for Americans United, AU.org. Um, these are the organizations lined up against the Ohio lesson plans for fairness, for balance, for equal time. I also have to show you the organizations that have lined up in favor of the lesson plan. Here they are. Um, and you can make your own decision as to whether or not this is a lesson plan in which you, as the people of the state of Ohio, should be proud. What is at stake in this? And quite frankly, this is where I want to close. I think what is at stake literally is everything. Um, this is a cartoon, last panel of a cartoon, that a friend of mine sent me. And you can see there's a young man here. I assume he's a Hindu or Pakistani. He's in a science laboratory studying science. And you can see this as the creationist found unlikely support among students in China and India. And this young man is saying, oh, yes, America, we would like it very much if you would teach your students, your children, religious dogma instead of science. We'd like their jobs. And I think uh, to, to, to pull absolutely no punches, what is at stake in this argument, in this debate, in this political struggle isn't whether students will learn evolution. I think that's small potatoes. Um, I don't think a generation of citizens will be harmed if they don't quite understand the difference between allopatric and sympatric speciation. I think what is, what is difficult is to contemplate an America, a generation of Americans growing up with a wedge driven between them and science. And the intelligent design movement proposes to drive exactly that wedge, which is aimed to produce what they call a theistic science. If that happens, then something that all of us in this room have taken for granted during our lifetimes is going to change. And that something is that the United States is the worldwide leader in scientific research and technology. If we put that mantle down, and I think this movement has the potential to cause that to actually happen, a dozen nations around this world will eagerly pick it up, will take scientific leadership from us, and will never give it back. And that is what is at stake in Ohio and every one of the American states. Thank you very much for coming to me.
Professor Miller very much for his talk. Uh, he is open to questions. How much time, roughly? Oh, uh, we've got as much as one and a half hour. Okay. Uh, fine. Uh, okay, we'll figure that's probably a reasonable time. Uh, uh, I'm going to moderate this, which means simply that I will point to people to stand up and ask questions. Uh, and uh, Patricia has suggested that I might contribute any comments that uh, I would find helpful, but I will try to be very restrained in doing that. Uh, so who has questions? Yes. Um, Dr. Miller, how do you explain these, quote, legitimate scientists supporting this? I am embarrassed to confess that Dr. Behe is a biophysicist. I am as well. And I was shocked to see that he was doing this. I've known him for many years. How do they get into this? And what's going on? What's their agenda? Well, I, I'm not going to pretend for a minute to be able to psychoanalyze um, the people who stand on the other side of this debate. Um, but I will point out that almost to a person, they regard evolution as the foundation of a dangerous scientific materialism. And I'm going to point to somebody who I think really summed up the reason for the opposition best. And, and I think this reason applies even to a trained scientist like Michael Behe or Jonathan Wells, who has two PhDs, or Stephen Meyer, who's trained in philosophy. Um, this summer in August, I was listening to an interview on National Public Radio. And it was an interview with Senator Rick Santorum from Pennsylvania, who's just published a new book called It Takes a Family. And in there, it was like a 10-minute interview, and it was just to let him you know, promote his book and say what it was about. But in the middle of it, the interviewer asked him, you know, Senator Santorum, I found it strange that in the middle of your book you took a shot at part of the science curriculum. Now, you're a senator, a politician, with no training in science, but nonetheless, you decided to take a shot at evolution. And then he said, why evolution? And it's almost an exact quote uh, that I almost have it memorized. And Senator Santorum says, because it really matters. It's where we come from. And he said, if we're just an accident, if we're a mistake of nature, then that puts a different moral demand on us. And he thought for a second and said, in fact, it doesn't put a moral demand on us. Then if we are the intentional creation of a supreme being who does make moral demands. Now think about that. Because what he said is that if evolution is right, morality is an illusion. And morality isn't just, don't do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Morality is what's right in the world. How do you treat the poor? Issues of war and peace, economic justice, fairness, personal integrity. Morality matters, and I think it matters to all of us. It certainly matters to me. If you actually come to believe that evolution as a doctrine invalidates any sense of morality, you're going to oppose it, whether you think it's scientifically justified or not. Now, I'm not going to pretend to look inside Dr. Behe's head and see if that's exactly what is making him tick. But I do know he has said very clearly that he thinks evolution and evolutionary materialism is a morally destructive doctrine. And I would assume that's the source of the motivation. Next question. Got one up on the balcony. Okay, up there. Um, Listen loud. You'll have to sure. talk loudly. Sure. Um, these folks uh, wouldn't participate through the political process instead of the scientific process unless that's where the fertile ground was. I, I've spent a lot of time on the political left and noticed that hostility towards science is just as great there. The new age stuff you were talking about, astrology, etc. You betcha. So yeah. What is it that we ought to be doing better? Well, I, I, that's a really good question, and I also, um, as, as an ex Barry Goldwater Republican, um, I appreciate you saying that large elements of the left are anti-science, and it certainly is true. And you see this, for example, I think you see this most clearly in the European left, uh, where the European left has been enormously hostile to science and technology. I think, and, uh, and I'll accuse myself first, I think that we in science suck at getting our message across to the public. We are terrible popularizers. And as an example of that, I would ask how many people in the audience were aware of the discovery regarding the fusion of human chromosome number two, which was worked out about 